So the first of them is from Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala and this is from his book Dar Miftar al-Sa'ada and um, Miftah Dar al-Sa'ada I got the title of the round Miftah Dar al-Sa'ada and so he says قَدْ شَهِدَتِ الْفِطْرِ وَالْعُقُولِ بِأَنَّ لِلْعَالَمُ رَبًّا قَادِرًا حَكِيمًا عَلِيمًا رَحِيمًا كَامِلًا فِي ذَاتِهِ وَصِفَاتِهِ لَا يَكُونُ إِلَّا مُرِيدًا لِلْخَيْرِ لِعِبَادِهِ مُجْرِيًا لَهُمُ الشَّرِيعَةَ وَالسُنَّةَ الْفَاضِلَةَ الْعَائِدَةَ بِاسْتِصْلَاحِهِمْ الْمُوَافَقَةَ لِمَا رَقَّبَ فِي عُقُولِهِمْ مِنْ إِسْتِحْسَانِ الْحَسَنِ وَاسْتِقْبَاحِ الْقَبِيحِ وما جبل طباعهم طباعهم عليه من ايثار النافع لهم المصلح لشأنهم وترك الضار المفسد لهم وشهدت هذه الشريعه له بانه احكم الحاكمين وارحم الراحمين وانه المحيط بكل شيء علما is a tremendous passage there are so many things in this passage that we can take uh, so to keep it brief uh, to summarize it he says that Everyone's fitra, your fitra, just your natural inclination, and everyone's intellect witnesses that this creation has a Lord who is powerful, who is wise, who is all knowing, who is all merciful, and He's perfect in His essence and His attributes. And He does not desire except goodness for His servants. Right? So we begin. By this fact, that it is a fact, by what Allah has revealed to us, that He does not desire except khair for His ibad. All of the ibad, the Muslim or non-Muslim. Right? Allah Azza wa Jal, He is, la yakun illa muridan lil khairi li ibadih. He desires goodness for all of His servants. And He prescribes for them the sharia. And the sunnah, the sunnah as well, the excellent virtuous sunnah, which brings back upon them rectification. It brings back upon the people rectification. And at the same time, Allah has already implanted into their intellects to recognize and treat as good what is good. And to recognize as evil and repugnant what is evil. So meaning that Allah Azza wa Jal has put in the minds of people the ability to understand and to know this thing is repugnant. Stealing is harmful and repugnant. And this thing, fornication, is harmful and repugnant. To commit fornication, it's harmful and repugnant. And this thing, so he's already put it in the minds of the people. There are many things which, which people know without even receiving revelation. You do not need to receive revelation to know that murder and theft is wrong. Right? You don't need revelation to tell you that. That's something that the intellects, they can figure out that, hang on, murder is wrong. And stealing is wrong, theft is wrong. From experience and from reflection, they, they know it's wrong. So Allah has put that capacity in the minds of the people. So therefore, when, when the intellect already knows and, and can grasp certain things are wrong, then when the sharia of Allah comes, and then the, the intellects naturally just accept, they, they, they can recognize, yes, this is, is rectification, what it is commanding and prohibiting. Then he says, and likewise, Allah has also made the people their nature, to be inclined towards choosing what is beneficial and abandoning what is harmful. It's in the nature of humans to choose what is beneficial to them and to abandon what is harmful to them. Right? So there are four or five things here that we need to extract as, as important points. Number one, after we establish that there is a Lord with knowledge, wisdom, power, mercy, right, behind this creation, then it follows that he desires nothing but goodness for his servants, for all of his servants. And in order to make them receive this goodness, then he has basically 
put in their minds, in their aql, their reason, the ability to know that something is harmful and to know that something is beneficial. To know that something is good and know that something is evil. So not only did he put that in their intellects, he also put a feeling in them as well, where they are inclined towards choosing what benefits them, and they will keep away from what will be harmful to them. This is just the nature of Allah's creation. And therefore, he says, uh, the, 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 the sharia, when we look at this sharia, we study it, we analyze it, we look at what it commands, what it prohibits, then it will be a witness that Allah is أَحْكَمُ الْحَاكِمِينَ وَأَرْحَمُ الرَّاحِمِينَ وَأَنَّهُ الْمُحِيطُ بِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ ilma. The three attributes here. That Allah is, is the, has hikmah. Number two, that He has rahmah, mercy. And thirdly, that He has ilm. His knowledge is comprehensive. Right? So these three attributes, the comprehensive knowledge of Allah, His wisdom and His mercy, all of His laws and commands, they emanate from these three attributes. Allah knows what He created. He created the male. He created the female. He knows what each one is. He knows the interests of each person. He created all of the creatures. He created all of the elements. He created you know, everything and, and every little thing. He knows what it is. Its benefits, its harms, its uses. And so that's his ilm. And then his hikmah, his wisdom, that he desires goals, that there are, there are goals and objectives behind what he does and what he commands. And rahma mercy, that he wants to be merciful to his creatures. All of the Sharia laws, they are derived, they emanate from, and they spring from these three attributes. And when we study the Sharia, then we see these three attributes being, being, being manifest. Being manifest. So, this is a beautiful statement. There's a lot more that can be taken from it. But again, for the sake of brevity, we want to be brief and to the point. And the second statement he has, again from the same source, Miftah Dar al-Sa'adah, he says, um, sorry, this actually is from another book, Shifa'ul Alil, and he says, the wisdom behind the sending of the messengers with legislations. Why did Allah send messengers with legislations? He said, He said that Allah bestowed His favor upon His servants by sending messengers to them, and by revealing books upon them, and by informing them about His commands and His prohibitions, and about what He loves and what He is displeased with. This favor, this favor that Allah has given us, meaning of the book, revelation, commands, prohibitions, this is the greatest, loftiest, most excellent favor. This favor is more greater than Allah giving us the sun, and the moon, and the rain, and the plants. Right? So the, these are favors, no doubt, that the sun, the moon, the rain, the plants, the animals, the clothing, all of these are, no doubt, these are definitely favors. Favors in the sense of, of creation. But this other favor, the favor of sending messengers, books, legislations, commands, prohibitions, this is the greatest favor. And the favor of the sun, the moon, uh, you know, and all these other things that, 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 that he mentioned, plants, rain, they cannot be compared to the favor which, which lies in the sending of the messengers. The favor of ilm and iman and the legislations, and the halal, and the haram, right? These are much greater than those other favors. So, Ibn al-Qayyim, he mocks and he rejects the person who says, look, what wisdom is there in the laws and, and, and you know, in the commands and prohibitions? What wisdom is there? A person denying that there are wisdoms and goals in, in, the, in the commands and prohibitions. And those people who say it is just nothing but just tiredness, you know, commands and prohibitions just like they, 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 it's like what the, as we said, those people, the deists, those who believe there's a creator, 
but don't believe in revelation and religion. They say religion is just shackles. It just limits you and restricts you. It's just do's and don'ts, right? So when you eliminate the aspect of wisdom from the commands and prohibitions, all you have is do's and don'ts. And that's how they see, that's how they see the Sharia. Right? The Sharia is just do this, don't do that. Do this, don't do that. This is haram, this is halal. That's how they see it. Right? And now you can see that we as Muslims, we must not see the Sharia in that manner. We must educate ourselves to understand the goals and the wisdoms so that it is not just merely do's and don'ts that we do, and do's and don'ts that we that we that we you know implement. Uh, Ibn al-Qaim says, "For by Allah, the one who claims that, the one who thinks that, the one who presumes that about the one who is the most wise, then he is more astray than the cattle. He is more astray than the cattle. The one who believes that all the Muslims have is halal, haram. Don't do this. Do that. Just a set of commands. No wisdom. No purpose." No lofty objectives, no you know lofty outcomes, right? This person who thinks like this, he is more astray and more misguided, misguided than the cattle that you see in the field, and he is in you know he says, "For Allah inna man zama dalik wa dhanhu fi ahkam al hakimin la adalla min al anami la adalu min al anami wa aswa uhalan min al min al hamir." He is more astray than cattle and in a more evil condition than a donkey. And we seek refuge from Allah, from, you know, from ignorance, from being ignorant about Ar-Rahman, about Ar-Rahman and his names and his attributes. So this now is very clear. Uh, these two statements should make it very clear to us that to treat the legislation of Islam as something that restricts you and ties you down and limits you and controls you and shackles you, which is the perception that these people want to portray, like the, the three, four groups that we mentioned at the beginning. Uh, this is something that we have to reject. <coughs> we have to denounce. Anyone who thinks that, like that, then he's more astray than cattle and are in a more evil condition than donkeys. Because legislation... <coughs> There are, there are goals and wisdoms behind legislation, which we're going to discuss inshallah ta'ala. So now we come to the third statement from Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah. And this is something very important to understand. This point is related to the fact that there are wisdoms and reasons behind the commands and the prohibitions of Allah Azza wa Jal. So he wants he so he illustrates this point by mentioning a verse in the Quran which is very important for us to understand. Surah Al-Araf, Surah 7, verse 157. Wa yuhillu lahum at-tayyibat wa yuharrimu alayhim al-khaba'if. This verse is speaking about the messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and it is describing some of his qualities and characteristics. And one of the things which it mentions and says about him is that he, meaning the messenger, he makes halal for them the tayyibat. He makes lawful for them, the believers, those things which are wholesome and good. And he makes unlawful upon them the khaba'if, those things which are filthy and evil and harmful. Now, there's a tremendous point that we need to understand from this ayah. Ibn al-Qayyim says, فَهَذَا صَرِيحٌ فِي أَنَّ الْحَلَالَ كَانَ طَيِّبًا قَبْلَ حِلِّهِ وَأَنَّ الْخَبِيثَ كَانَ خَبِيثًا قَبْلَ تَحْرِيمِهِ وَلَمْ يُسْتَفَدْ طِيبُ هَذَا وَخُبْثُ هَذَا مِنْ نَفْسِ الْحِلِّ وَالتَّحْرِيمِ So what he's saying now is that this verse is clear evidence that whatever is halal, whatever the Qur'an came and declared to be halal, it was already tayyib, it was already pure and wholesome before Allah declared it to be halal. And whatever was khabif, whatever Allah made unlawful, 
it was already khabif before Allah made it to be unlawful. Right? So, to make sure you understand this point, let me illustrate. If, if someone said, if I was to say that committing fornication, to commit zina, which is to have relations outside of marriage, if I said that that only became khabif, filthy and vile, after Allah revealed the Qur'an and after Allah declared it to be haram, would that be correct? Does something become evil and khabif because of the label of haram upon it? Or is it because it is actually khabith, it is actually khabith in and of itself? That's right, yeah. So for example, if I, you know, if, if I had, um, like if I have alcohol and it's intoxicating, right? Was it intoxicating before it was declared haram? Yes. Yeah. So that means there was a reason why it was made haram. What was the reason? What's the reason? Because it's intoxicating. Right? This shows that substances as well as people's actions as well as actions they can be tayyib or khabith. Right? Actions and substances have properties. They have inherent properties. And it is on the basis of those properties that something has been made halal or haram. Right? This is what is correct. What is not correct is that it is only after Allah declared something to be halal that it is now tayyib. And it is only after Allah declared something to be haram that it is now khabith. Did adultery and fornication become khabif after Allah declared it to be haram? Or was it already like that before? Yes, do you understand this point? A very important point. Why? Because there are some people of bid'ah who were saying this second thing. They were saying something only becomes halal, uh, becomes tayyib after it's made halal. Uh, this is wrong. Right? This, is, this is totally wrong. So Ibn Qayyim is establishing that things... And actions already have inbuilt inherent qualities and properties. Backbiting is haram, to backbite. Is that because there's something within it which is khabi, which is khubth? And harmful and evil? Is that the reason? Yes, that's the reason. Because it, because it, because, because it is evil. And likewise, namima, gossiping. Right? There are things about these actions which are inherently evil, harmful, which is why they have been prohibited. Right? So, the point being here is, uh, so, so he goes on to uh, elaborate upon this a bit more and to refute the idea that things only become tayyib after they've been made halal and things only become khabith after they've been made haram. This, this, is not, this is not true. He brings another ayah as evidence. He says, قُلْ إِنَّمَا حَرَّمَ رَبِّيَ الْفَوَاهِشِ مَا ظَهَرَ مِنْهَا وَمَا بَطَنْ وَالْإِثْمَ وَالْبَغْيَ بِغَيْرِ الْحَقِّ وَأَنْ تُشْرِكُوا بِاللَّهِ مَا لَمْ يُنَزِلْ بِهِ سُلْطَانًا وَأَنْ تَقُولُوا عَلَى اللَّهِ مَا, لم ما, على الله ما لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Say, my Lord has prohibited the fawahish. The fawahish are filthy, evil deeds. Those which are apparent and those which are hidden. And likewise, sin. And likewise oppression upon other than the truth. And that you commit shirk with Allah for that which He gave you no authority. And that you say upon Allah that which you do not know. There are four things mentioned here. To commit evil, filthy deeds. Number one, to fall into oppression. Number, th- number three, to commit shirk. And number four, to speak about Allah without knowledge. All of these four things, Ibn Qayyim says, وَهَذَا دَلِيلٌ عَلَىٰ أَنَّهَا فَوَاحِشْ فِي نَفْسِهَا All of these things are evil in and of themselves. They are inherently evil. That is why they are prohibited. It is not that they became evil when they were prohibited. Do you understand that difference between the two? It's vital to understand that difference between the two. 
So he says, فَضَلَّ عَلَىٰ أَنَّهُ حَرَّمَهَا لِكَوْنِهَا فَوَاهِشٍ وَحَرَّمَ الْخَبِيثِ لِكَوْنِهِ خَبِيثًا وَأَمْرَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ لِكَوْنِهِ مَعْرُوفًا So he says, this shows that he made them to be haram because they are filthy evil deeds. And he made the khabith to be, to be haram because it is khabith in and of itself. And he commanded with the ma'roof what is good because it is good. So, this is the third point that we wanted to make from Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah ta'ala, which is to understand clearly that whatever Allah has made halal, whatever Allah has made haram, then it is because there are specific qualities in those things for which they are deserving to be made halal and haram. And that whatever he commanded and whatever he prohibited his servants, then there are benefits that come to them. And there are harms which are repelled away from them in those things. And that is what leads us now into the the main bulk of our subject, which is what you see on the board right now. And this is the opening statement, which is that laws are legislated to bring about benefits and repel harms with the aim of protecting the beneficial interests, the masalih, the masalih of humanity. And it does this by guaranteeing their vital necessities, dhururiyat, their needs, which are hajat, and their means of perfection, which are tahsiniyat. When I said to you that there's a basic structure that you need to have in your mind, this is the essence of it right here. The essence of it is right here. Laws are legislated to bring about benefits and to repel harms from mankind with the aim of protecting their beneficial interests. These are the masalih. masalih. And it does so by guarantee, guaranteeing their vital necessities, dhururiyat, their needs, which are the hajat, and the means of perfection, which are the tahsiniyat. Right, let me... Now this, we will discuss this in a bit more detail. This is what we're going to explain now and expand upon in the lessons to follow. But before we pray, inshallah, if you bear with me and have patience for just a few more minutes, um, I'd like to explain one thing, is look at those three words, dururiyat, hajat, and tahsiniyat. All of our future lessons are going to be focused around these three things. Dururiyat, hajat, and tahsiniyat. tahsiniyat. And I want to give you a parable and an example so you have the idea firmly fixed in your mind. Right? So let me give you a parable. Uh, If you imagine that you are just out in the open and you have to bear the elements, the elements we mean the rain, the cold, the wind, the heat, right? Predatory animals could come and kill you, right? If you are out like this, then it is a necessity, it is from the dururiyat that you have shelter. Yes? No matter what type that shelter takes, that shelter could be in a cave, it could be in a home, but you need shelter. Right? So in this parable, in this situation, a shelter, a home, is from the dururiyat. Yes? It's from the, it's from the vital necessities. So in a similar manner, there are certain things in the sharia, in fact, there are five things, which are from the dururiyat. They are so vital that life cannot be established without them. Yes? Is that clear? This is the dururiyat. Now, when you are in the house, when you have shelter, there are now some other things, which we call the hajat. The hajat. These are needs. 
These are things which if you don't have them, life becomes difficult. You will have hardships. You will be uncomfortable. So for example, if you didn't have windows in your house to open when it's hot, to close when it's cold, if you didn't have a door in your house to keep out, for example, you know, uh, things that you don't want to come into your house, right? These things are not dhururiyah, they're not, they're not vital necessities, you can do without them, but life will be uncomfortable without them. Life will be difficult without them. This is what we call needs, hajat. You will need a door, you will need windows to make life, to, to remove hardships and difficulties. These are now the hajat, right? So we need hajat. There are many things in the Sharia which are from the Hajat. Yes? Which we need. For example, trade is from the Hajat. But prayer is from the Dhururiyat. Right? Can you now start seeing now how? When you start looking at the commands and the prohibitions, you can start separating them. This thing serves the purpose of the Dhururiyat. This thing here serves the purpose of the Hajat. Yes? Then the third category is what we call the tahsiniyat. Tahsiniyat. These are the things which are basically they 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 just decoration, perfection, completion, right? So you don't need carpets in the house. But if you had carpets, it's nice. It's nice. It's you know, you can have. You don't need furniture in the house. But if you had furniture in the house, it's just a bit more comfortable, right? This now is the tahsiniyat. And there are many affairs in the Sharia which are from the tahsiniyat. Right? So for example, you come to prayer, you should wear good clothes. They should be clean and pure. You come to the masjid, wear clean clothes. This now is tahsiniyat. There are many affairs which are from the tahsiniyat. They add perfection to what comes before them of the dururiyat and the hajat. You understand? Right? So, so the scholars have come with this classification on the basis of evidences of a comprehensive study of life and of people. And this is not unique to, in fact, it's very clear that this is not unique to, this is general. Right? This is, this is universal what we are discussing here. Right? And this is how we understand the Islamic law. Islamic law has come to protect the beneficial interests of mankind by guaranteeing the dururiyat and the hajat and the tahsiniyat. And there are certain things which come under each of these three categories. What are the necessities that we can't do, that you know, are essential? What are the hajat that we must have to make life easy, to facilitate life? And what are the things which perfect and complete and which decorate, right? What are those things? So that is what we are going to uh, discuss, inshallah ta'ala, in the lessons to come. And all of our lessons essentially are going to be an explanation of this opening statement. And so with that, we will conclude our lesson there for today, our opening lesson. Inshallah ta'ala, we will continue uh, hopefully in two weeks' time, uh, and, and progress with the with the rest of the materials, inshallah. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, wa sallallahu ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.